My name is Mark Shari Kozar. I'm an open source tech lead at Cisco. I'm also a CNCF ambassador as of this March. But for the last couple of years, my primary job was to help engineering teams run their business applications on top of Kubernetes without worrying about things like configuration management, secret management, or deployment pipelines. But before we jump into the presentation, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Who uses Kubernetes here right now, or used, or plan to use? OK, so who uses Kubernetes secrets? OK, so who rotates those secrets periodically in an automated way? How can you sleep at night? <laughs> All right, so um, I'd like to start by telling a story, which I believe will be familiar to a lot of you. A couple of years ago, uh, I was in a debug session in the middle of the night. I probably had a couple of beers in me at that point. Uh, and um, I figured out the problem. It was a um, release that went out that day. Fixed it, uh, pushed it to Git, uh, and I was about to go home when all the bells went off. Turned out I managed to commit and push AWS credentials to a public repository, um, which is obviously not good. And I was so lazy and reckless that I actually took those credentials from an active instance in a development environment. All right, so I was, I uh, rotated the credentials. It was a dev environment, that was fine. Rotated the credentials, deployed a new one. I was about to go home when even more bells went off. It turned out that those exact same credentials were used in three different other environments, including a production one. So what started as a simple debug session ended basically in a production incident. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Oh, uh, OK. So obviously, there are lots of ways humans can uh, leak secrets and uh, cause production incidents. But uh, coming from a Kubernetes directive or direction, there are, uh, there are other ways to compromise secrets. For example, there is a common misconception about Kubernetes secrets that they are insecure because they use base64 encoding. Well, why they can be really insecure is because there is no encryption at rest configured by default in Kubernetes. So if you just spin up any Kubernetes instance on any cloud provider, those secrets will be stored in plain text in etcd or in any other database that the cloud provider uh, uses for their Kubernetes offering. So that is a problem. Uh, if you can trust your provider, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a public cloud provider. But if you store secrets in Kubernetes, basically they are available in plain text in etcd. Another way to compromise secrets is, and this is actually my favorite, not setting RBAC up properly. Like a lot of people often uh, think about disabling access to secrets to developers so they can't access Kubernetes secrets, but they still give execution privileges into the pods for debugging reasons which means that basically any developer who has those permissions can just go into the pod and get the secrets the same way that they would just get from Kubernetes. So it's really not about when your secrets will be compromised. It's really about uh, what you are going to do about it. Obviously, there will always be a human factor, but there are a bunch of other uh, ways to get secrets compromised. And uh, well, what can you do about it? Obviously, you can do a lot of things. But if you uh, read it, the title of this talk, today's topic will be rotating secrets. And uh, when I talk to other people about rotating secrets, they often uh, get scared. That, do, they, do we really have to rotate all the secrets we have? Like in a lot of applications, we have a bunch of different secrets. And the answer is, you only need to rotate secrets that are not rotated automatically anyway. Like a, in a bunch of uh, cases, if you use workload identities, for example, those are already those, those already use short-lived tokens, and you don't need to think about rotating those. You need to think about rotating the long-lived credential type secrets. 
So why, why, why is it important to write its secrets? And we already talked about one of the reasons why it's important, because if you leak something, for example, you push it to a public repository, um, then you have to rotate the secret. But um, you may have to rotate secrets because your STO said so. Like, if there is a rule in your company that you have to rotate all your secrets every 90 days, you just have to. You don't, you don't ask. But the absolute worst possible scenario is when you don't even know that your secret is leaked and you just continue using it uh, while a malicious actor may be running Bitcoin mining on your EC2 instances or where steal your data. Uh, now, when we think about the challenges of rotating secrets, obviously, depending on your environment, you may have multiple Kubernetes clusters, you may run different applications in different scenarios. So it's generally a complex, pro complex process and it doesn't work well with humans. So we are not really good at complex tasks and we tend to screw those up as well. So it's, which obviously uh, in, a, in the worst case ends up disrupting your service availability. So all this really points to the fact that secret rotation, well, goes without saying should be possible, but possible in this case means it should be possible within a reasonable time frame. If you can't rotate your secrets quickly enough in case uh, a secret actually gets leaked, then you have a problem. You either uh, expose your system to a potential attack or you risk, uh, or, or you actually, um, end up disrupting your, your service availability. So it should be possible. It should be automated because it's not something that humans should do. And if you think about the uh, scenario I just mentioned that you don't even know your secret is leaked, it should be done periodically. So how does this look like uh, in practice? Um, not in the context of Kubernetes, but in, in general. So generally you have some sort of secret store this is where you store your secrets. This is where you deploy your configuration or secrets from to some environment or multiple environments. You have some sort of secret provider, which may be AWS, GitHub, whatever. And you generate these secrets from those secret providers and store those secrets in your store. Now on the deployment side, you need something that watches your secrets and deploys the new secret to your production or dev or whatever environments that you have when something changes. So how does this look like in Kubernetes? So first of all, you have to decide if you really want to use Kubernetes secrets or not. As I mentioned before, if you don't plug the holes, then using Kubernetes secrets may not be for you. So make sure to turn on encryption at rest. It's called, I believe it's called encryption config on a lot of cloud providers you will um, see it as uh, envelope encryption. Make sure you configure RBAC properly and generally just go to the Kubernetes best practices page and just go through the recommended steps and just apply those. If you want to use Kubernetes secrets, make sure that you do the most you can to secure the use of uh, Kubernetes secrets. All right, so how do we deploy secrets to Kubernetes? Obviously, you can just kubectl apply uh, a secret object to the Kubernetes API, but if you have multiple Kubernetes clusters, if you have multiple different environments, that, that's probably not something you want to do. Especially if you have a, like a GitOps workflow where you want to automate the whole secret deployment process. So this is where the external secrets operator or just external secrets comes into play. It's, um, it's an operator. Uh, you can configure it through custom resources and it basically synchronizes secrets from an external secret store like HashiCorp's vault, all the different, different cloud provider based secret stores to Kubernetes secrets, which is great because you can actually put these custom resources to your GitHub's workflow because they don't actually contain the secret. They just contain the instructions, how the secret should be deployed to the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and once uh, ESO deploys the secret into the cluster, you can use that secret as, the, as you usually would. You can mount it as environment variables, you can mount it as a file. 
So very quickly, how it really how it works behind the scenes. Uh, as I mentioned, you configure ESO uh, through custom resources. Similarly, how you would configure Cert Manager, you can configure a cluster level secret store or an namespace code secret store. Uh, the naming is a little bit unfortunate because you call the secret store your external secret store where you actually store the secrets and the custom resource is also called secret store, which is basically the configuration for your external secret store, how external secrets can go to the secret store and synchronize secrets from to your Kubernetes cluster. And then you have the external secret object, which um, tells the external secrets operator to configure a particular secret from your secret store to a Kubernetes secret in a certain format. So we have a lot of options here. If you want uh, some sort of templating or you want uh, to generate a file or something, Yeah, so the cluster secret store is in a cluster scoped resource, while everything on the right here is namespace scoped. It's similar to how it works in Cert Manager with the cluster issuer and, and the issuer. Uh, all right. Um, so there are, there are alternatives that you could use if you wanted to. Sealed secrets is a pretty uh, um, popular one. The problem with sealed secrets and, and SOPs in general is that they don't really work well in a multi-cluster or multi-tenant environment. Yes, of course, you can share the key between the clusters and, and you can absolutely do that, but uh, you still have to expose the key to the developers or whoever manages the secrets for encryption and you can't essentially revoke them without re-encrypting everything. So generally speaking, I find ESO to be a better solution at this point, but if um, someone needs a, a quick start solution, sealed secrets may, may work um, as well. So I deploy the secret in the cluster. I have it, the application is running, and uh, something changes. ESO can actually synchronize changes, so you can specify an interval that you want the operator to check the secrets and it can actually synchronize changes as well. So now what? Well, if you mount the secret as a file into your pod, then obviously your application needs to take care of reloading that file and, and reloading the secret. But if you inject the secret as, an, as environment variables, you can't really do that on the application level. So what you need to do there is actually trigger a new rollout um, and so far, I mean, Reloader is a pretty new component on the market. I mean, it's one or two years old, but so far we didn't really, really have, right, like a good solution. Reloader um, can manage triggering like standard workload rollouts uh, when any of the Kubernetes secrets referenced in those uh, workloads change. So it's pretty cool. And going back to our earlier um, process, now we have Kubernetes in the middle, uh, which is our environment. We have external secrets that deploys the secrets to the Kubernetes cluster. And we have reloader that watches for, for those changes and triggers workload rollout. So basically with this pipeline, whenever something changes in the secret store, you never have to touch anything. It automatically uh, deploys the secret to the Kubernetes cluster and it automatically reloads uh, the workloads. So, sounds good so far. Uh, it, it actually works pretty great as well. We've had this uh, in place for almost two years now. Um, but the next question is obviously, how can all this go wrong? Well, the first, first answer is who knows? So you have to monitor your entire um, secret management pipeline uh, and you have to um, have some tools to notice when something goes wrong. And fortunately, ESO exposes a bunch of different metrics. They, they, they also have like SLI uh, recommendations for you. Uh, I do recommend to revise those and, and fine tune those to your needs. Depending on how you deploy uh, secrets to Kubernetes, you may want to um, observe different metrics. 
They also have a very nice Grafana dashboard that's good for an overall overview of how the operator works currently, but it's not that great for debugging. Like when something is going wrong, it's not that great. So I've opened an issue and I'm working with the ESO team to come up with a better dashboard that can help debugging issues. And uh, one additional note here is that some of the metrics include resource names as labels, which in very high environments can cause problem because of the high cardinality. So you, you may either want to drop those labels if you don't use them, or just drop them, drop the metrics entirely. Uh, but this is something that we actually had to deal with. Now, another common problem with ESO is that when you change something, you change a, a secret store configuration, or you change some authorization details on in HashiCorp's vault, for example, that change doesn't actually take effect until the next synchronization pe period of a, an external secret. So the problem is when you change something, you don't actually know if you broke anything or not. So what we did here to solve this problem is we actually have test secrets for every single secret store that we have. And every time we change something, we make sure that this secret gets deployed again. So we know if something goes wrong, we have alerts. If any of those test secret synchronization fails, the alert goes off and we can fix the problem. Uh, but this is not something that's immediately obvious, and uh, this is something that we've learned the hard way. Another other issue we had recently, which I'm told may not be an issue anymore in newer ver versions of ESO, but I wanted to talk about it anyway because it's uh, such an edge case and it still happened. So in the secret store, there is this option called store validation, which means you can tell external secrets not to synchronize anything until it can reliably communicate with the store. So if the store goes down, it doesn't start synchronizing all those external secrets, still hammering the not working external, external secret store, which is great. Uh, and we had that turned on. And naturally, our internal world went down for like five hours. And the store validation has a retry on it with a nice back off, which after five hours were somewhere at the day interval, which meant our complete synchronization pipeline stopped working. Which we've learned the hard way because some of the secrets should have been rotated and the secret was not synchronized because it wasn't working at all. The whole pipeline stopped working, which means it caused a production incident for us. So I'm told this may not be a problem anymore, but um, a seemingly simple problem like the store going down actually caused the entire synchronization pipeline to stop working. Um, our solution for this problem, we use GitOps, we use Argo CD to deploy all of the configuration to all of our clusters. So what we did, we basically added an annotation to all of the store configurations, which uh, caused the store validation to uh, start again, and that restored everything. But doing that across dozens of clusters manually um, would have been hard. So to, to sum up ESO, um, it's a great solution together with Reloader. You really don't have to touch anything for it to work, but you still need to understand how and when changes take effect, and you still have to monitor and alert for everything to make sure that, um, well, it doesn't stop working. Now that's, uh, okay. So you may decide that you don't want to use Kubernetes secrets at all because you can trust your provider, because you can't change any configuration uh, to plug all those holes I talked about. Or maybe you just don't want to use Kubernetes secrets for whatever reason. So you can, you can do that if you want to. Uh, in that case, naturally, you will have to talk to the secret store directly somehow. Now, option A is to integrate that communication into the application directly, but that's not really what we want to do. Like keeping configuration and secret management apart from the application is usually a great idea because you may have to deploy it into different environments. You may not want to tie your, your configuration management to your application. So we need something else. 
And the alternative is that you inject those secrets into the application somehow, for example, using environment variables. Now, in case of Kubernetes, there are some solutions available. And they generally work the same way. Like, usually they have a mutating admission webhook that mutates pods being created on Kubernetes. They inject a custom init into the container through uh, a mounted volume. They change the entry point as well so that uh, the custom init goes first. And then they inject environment variables into the application somehow. Now, different solutions use different strategies for, um, for determining what secrets needs to be injected. One of those solutions is called bank vaults. Anyone heard about bank vaults before? OK. So bank vaults uh, started at Banzai Cloud as a project, and it's now uh, being developed at Cisco. I'm, I'm one of the uh, original engineers. And we like to call uh, bank vaults uh, vault Swiss Army knife. HashiCorp's vault Swiss Army knife, because it's not just a secret injection solution. It can run vault on top of Kubernetes for you. It can configure vault for you. And it can do that secret injection I talked about. So how does that work in case of bank vaults? Uh, but in bank vaults, we use the so-called secret reference. And we set them as environment variables for the application. The mutating webhook, we, we use a mutating webhook as well. The mutating webhook goes through the pods, the secrets, and all the custom resources that take place in creating a pod and scan for these secret references. If there is such secret reference, it's going to mutate the pod. It's going to inject the custom init. And that custom init uh, is going to replace those secret references with the actual secrets from Vault uh, as you can see, the secret reference contains vault call on the path to the secret, and then optionally a key if there is a specific secret you want. And that custom unit replaces the secret references with the actual values. Now, the only downside of this solution at the moment is that uh, it doesn't actually detect changes. So once you started a pod with a secret, and if the secret changes in vault, that's um, uh, the solution doesn't detect it. It's not going to trigger a workload reload yet. This is something we are working on right now. But currently, um, uh, it's not part of bank vaults. What we did in the past with bank vaults is that we basically triggered the virtual reload every day or basically just shorter than the interval for secret changes. Now, obviously, as in case of ESO, this solution comes with its own risks and, and, and trade-offs. For example, if the secret store goes down, then you can't start applications because you don't have access to the secrets. Whereas with ESO, you have all the secrets there in the Kubernetes cluster. So even if the store goes down, you can still uh, schedule applications. Uh, your, you can still scale your applications because the secrets are locally available in the cluster. Now, similar to that solution, you can actually start a vault instance with bank vaults within the cluster and synchronize the secrets from your central secret store to that local cluster instance and talk to that local cluster instance instead of your central external secret store. And that actually comes with a bunch of other advantages. For example, you're not going to hammer your central secret store with requests. You can just talk to the cluster local instance which is nice. And obviously, if the cluster local instance goes down, um, you'll have to fix that. But it still reduces the risk um, in case something happens to the, to the central secret store. The other problem is the webhook itself. If the mutating webhook goes down for any reason, uh, and it can very easily go down if you are not careful with its configuration, then you won't be able to schedule pods at all, Dep depending on the error policy that you define in your mutating webhook. But if you ignore the error, then your application will still not be able to launch because you, still, you will still not have any of the secrets injected into the application. So if the webhook goes down, so, do your, so do, does your ability to schedule applications. Now, there is a list of best practices that you can follow. I actually wrote a blog post about that. Make sure your webhook is highly available. Um, make sure it's spread across your cluster. So if one node group goes down, for example, uh, your webhook is still available. 
And of course, there are alternatives uh, for this kind of operation as well. Camus is being one which actually stores the secrets encrypted within the cluster and then with the injected custom in it binary within the container, it talks to its central service running in the cluster and decrypts the secrets on the fly, which is, which sounds somewhat better because you, you can still schedule applications, you can still schedule pods if something happens with your central secret store, but its development uh, kind of died down in the last couple of years. So it's not really actively used in the community. And the other solution that's coming up is the uh, secret store CSI driver. But the problem is you can mostly use that for fi mounting files in the containers. You can't really use it for mounting environment variables, um, which is fine. But if you want to use environment variables, you obviously can't use that. And as far as, it can, as far as I know, it can't detect changes yet either. So a couple, a couple um, um, things about Mankwalt. Uh, we are tr trying to um, revive the community around bank quads. We are moving it to a new GitHub organization. So if anyone wants to contribute, it's, it's going to be way easier. Uh, as I mentioned, we are going to work on the workload reload feature. So we are going to detect secret changes and we are going to trigger, trigger workload rollouts uh, on secret changes. We also plan to support more providers. Currently, we only support HashiCorp's vault, but the secret injection can actually work with any kind of secret store out there. So we're planning to add more providers. And we are also planning to add the new feature to the Mankwell suite, which is secret synchronization. I mentioned earlier that you can run a cluster local vault instance if you want to and synchronize secrets. Now, we don't really have tools for that at the moment, and we plan to give you some tools so you can do that um, easy, more easily. And if you have any feature requests or if you're interested in bank vaults, please just talk to us because um, we definitely want to hear from the community and uh, we want to hear how you use bank vaults. Now, I actually prepared a little demo. Uh, I'm not sure if we have, oh, we have time. So I just want to quickly show you how external secret works. Let's see. Maybe let's turn back mirroring here. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I have a, a local kind cluster here. It's running Vault within uh, using the Vault operator. Uh, ESO is already installed, and uh, the re reloader component is already installed. And I can show you that. Hopefully I have, still have the forward running, yeah. So I can talk to Vault, I can uh, grab the secret from it. And I already have the application deployed, I believe. I just need to set up the forward as well. Oops. All right. So I have the application running, and it's basically the world, the world, world here is coming from a secret. I can easily show that to you. Uh, deploy, demo, deployment, I believe, yeah. So as you can see, the environment variable hello is injected from a secret, which is which is synchronized by ESO from Vault. Now, if I go ahead and change this secret to something else, uh, let's say, hello everyone, and I go back to the service, nothing changed. If I take a look at the secret, the secret changed. Previously it said world, now it says everyone. So what I can do here is I can manually roll out trigger it all out for the application. Obviously, I have to restart the port forward, though I wish there was something that could do that automatically. And if I take a look at, by the way, can you see the <laughs> console? Okay. So if I take a look at the output now, obviously, it uses the new secret. 
Now let's change this. Uh, actually, let's let's enable a reloader now. So I can do that by annotating the deployment. I'm going to tell reloader, okay, start watching for any kind of secret changes, and please trigger a rollout when something changes. So this is going to change the uh, deployment. And I'm going to change the secret as well. If I take a look at the secret, the secret is changed. And probably I can't talk to the application now because the port forward is down. So I'm going to restart that. And if I go back to the application, now it says Hello Open Source Summit, which is the secret I've changed the last time, which is, which is what I changed the secret uh, to the last time. And I didn't do a menu all out here. Uh, for the last time, it was all done by Reloader. If we take a look at the... Um, the instance itself, we should see uh, revision increased. It basically uses the same way when you use kubectl preload restart. Uh, it increases the re revision count on the deployment. All right, uh, where is my... So uh, if, you, if you would like to see a more detailed demo, I have one for bank as well, but I don't think we have time for that. Uh, but I'm happy to talk about this. You can, you can actually uh, try this out. It's on my GitHub. Um, it's very simple. You just need some Kubernetes cluster, which, which can be kind. And I have all the instructions detailed in the readme, so you can easily try this. But I can show you in the hallway if, if you want to after the presentation. So to kind of summarize all this, it may not be uh, the best life advice or the key to happiness, but certainly in, in, in um, secret management, it's always better to assume the worst, prefer, prepare yourself for the worst possible scenario, and then you can actually sleep at night. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. There's a microphone over here, I believe, so. Hi. Um, I had a question about um, Kubernetes Secrets itself. Um, I, I want to get your viewpoint on this. Um, I was told that, sure, so Kubernetes Secrets not is not secure because I can just base 64 encode it, or uh, decode it, uh, to see the real text. But I've told, I'm told that apparently now we can actually like encode it with some salt some hash okay so the b64 encoding is not actually the problem right because it's for encoding and if you think about the types of uh, secrets you may store sometime for example certificates you absolutely need the ability to encode those so that's why b64 encoding was added to secrets the problem is that by default there is no encryption at rest in kubernetes so the, the default setting is plain text and the reason for that is obviously, depending on the provider you are running on, you have to configure different KMS providers, for example, if you want to encrypt those with KMS. But you can configure your own encryption at rest. I think it's called encryption configuration, where you can tell Kubernetes to encrypt the secrets before it stores them in etcd. So basically, that's how you can protect your secrets from being stored anywhere in plain text. Um, when you are running on a cloud provider, it's usually, it usually is called envelope encryption, and you can use KMS. For example, if you are running on a AWS and EKS, you can use AWS KMS to, to encrypt those secrets. Obviously, you are still trusting AWS not to um, abuse your KMS <laughs> solution and, and, and uh, decrypt your secrets, but that's how you can make sure that it's not, it's not stored in plain text in etcd. Thank you. Any other questions? Oops. All right, if you, if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to me. 
you can find me in the hallways here, or you can send me an email, find me on Twitter. And um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>